So uh, Joe asked me just to share a little bit about my work, how I got started uh, writing about gender and sexuality in librarianship, and uh, that mostly this would be a conversation, uh, which I appreciate. Uh, and like I said, I started a new job, and it's interesting to see these empty bookshelves behind me, which I hope to fill uh, as time passes. So um, uh, I have been a librarian for 16 years now, which feels like a really long time. Um, and I got into the field from work as a, as a magazine fact checker. I had been uh, working at a magazine called Lucky. I don't know if you remember it. It was a magazine about shopping. Uh, and my job included things like going through the magazine and counting all the bargains so we could put on the cover line 385 bargains uh, inside, right? That sort of work. Uh, and I, I accidentally printed the wrong phone number on a fashion spread. Uh, and I printed the phone number for Saks instead of the phone number for Barney's and uh, was in serious trouble for like, I don't know, a month. And I was like, I can't have my life revolve around phone numbers for department stores. I want to do something meaningful. And so I uh, got a job at the library and went to library school and totally loved it immediately. So I don't know if that's true for, for you all, but I had my first class at Syracuse and was like, this is sort of what I was meant to do. Um, it was the sort of research question that has organized my life since then and I think what made library school exciting for me was this question of how uh, we order things in the library um, and I had been a, a I had studied anthropology as an undergraduate and had some sort of initial thoughts about uh, structure and classification and how those are culturally produced and contextual and contingent uh, so I had some of those thoughts from academic work, but I mostly had those thoughts from my own identity. So I uh, came out as a lesbian in college, uh, my sophomore year. Uh, did not have a sense that I had always been a lesbian, but like that identity was sort of, like I think if I had never left Boise, Idaho, you know, I probably would be married and maybe coaching a soccer team at this point. But instead, I was sort of in New York in a hotbed of sort of theoretically inclined people thinking about their gender and sexuality as um, both about desire, but also about sort of positionality and power in the world and that sort of thing. And so very much a political identity for me. Um, and I had a my first girlfriend transitioned and uh, was, was transgender and transitioned just after our relationship. And it was really brought home for me how much my identity was relational. So this question of like, well, I was with someone who was a woman who is now a man and maybe my sexuality and my gender identities are changing over time. They're contingent and relational based on who I am with at a given time or not with, right? They're political. So I might be a lesbian when I talk to my uh, mother, but when I am talking about my identity in political terms, definitely it's a queer identity and the sort of politics that come with that. So then I started working at the library uh, and was struck by how materials about what I saw as a contingent contextual identity were fixed in place in the classification structure and sort of where lesbians fit was you know within the sort of social problems and uh not in sort of sections of the library about political work or about um philosophy or religion judith butler her work was uh, shelved in philosophy because she's a philosopher uh that's her training but her work about gender had really animated my life and how I understood myself and why was she over here when the rest of my work was over there. So those, those, those sorts of questions. And I would say that um, all of my work has come from uh, sort of finding the library as it, as it is in conflict with how I understand myself um, and how I understand my identity and how I understand how the world works given my position in it. So, that has been the puzzle for me. How do I, how, how do I both 
exist in uh, the library and in language and socially and in relation to other people using fixed terms like a, like lesbian, uh, even though that isn't how I understand myself, right? So this this essential paradox where the library fixes in place things that are by definition changing and uh, challenging that fixity. Um, so that was that that was sort of my initial start. I would say that I. Uh, continue to puzzle over that question. My uh, sort of research interests have shifted a bit from uh, gender and sexual, sexual identity to thinking about how, how that works in uh, international contexts, like how are the ideologies of US global power reproduced in libraries in uh, other parts of the world. So my project right now is thinking about how that works in the Philippines a uh, former U.S. colony that continues to have those remnants um, of, of, of colonial experience built into their library and what are the ways that the libraries have uh, changed that to resist uh, the sort of colonial features of knowledge organization that's exported from the U.S. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is sort of the, the sort of uh, personal story, you know, <laughs> cognizance that I've just shared a lot about my, my uh, relationship history, but I think the best research questions and the most authentic research questions are the ones that come from our personal experience. I think those of us who occupy uh, minority positions in terms of our identity have uh, a unique, sort of a special sense of how um, sort of ideology and power works because we come up against it every day in the library. When people ask me about my boyfriend, which they don't really because I have this, <laughs> this like <life. laughs> You know, um, I'm growing my hair back. I had, I had cancer last year, so I've got this like. Your hair looks great. <laughs> Thank you. It's like I really, it's a throwback to to when I first came out. Um, yeah, so I guess that that's the introduction. Joe, do you want to sort of ask any questions or anything you yeah. like to talk um, about? Thanks so much, Emily. Um, I uh, realized that I should have um, done any kind of introduction before we started, um, but I'm Jo. Uh, I'm the co-chair of Spectra, which is the um, LGBT group um, at SLIS, um, student professional group for the librarians. Um, uh, social, 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 sorry. It's a social affinity group. Okay. It is a social affinity group. Um, we do a lot of professional um, oriented, like, talking to people in the field when we can, and we try to make space for people to hang out. Um, and um, yeah, I, oh, I use they, them also. Um, and um, we're so happy to have you here today, Emily. Thank you so much for um, introducing it. Um, I'm uh, gonna start us off with a question, but um, basically as, as of right now, um, anyone who is watching, um, the uh, go to meeting either at Sliss West or um, uh, elsewhere. You can hop on voice chat to ask a question or um, type it out in the web chat um, as you prefer. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to um, start by asking um, what, what do you find most challenging about? Um, writing about topics like power and sexuality in the specific context of libraries? Um, what do I find challenging about it? Uh, mm -hmm. I think there is an emphasis in our field on the practical. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the library literature, it is primarily uh, sort of case study research work about, um, you know, how can we make a better, how can we make interlibrary loan work better? What are some you know, I'm, a, I'm an instruction librarian, I'm a teaching librarian, so how can we uh, do, ins you know, how can we measure our effectiveness as instructors and sort of really sort of mechanical uh, sorts of questions. Uh, and so the challenge for me has been uh, sort of finding an audience for work that is analytic and uh, explicitly political. So I think there are openings in the field for that kind of work now that didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, I published an article about sort of the role of time in, in instruction. So how we, how, how time works and yeah, sort of a complicated sort of analytic argument and the peer review that I 
that I received back said this article would be improved if the analytic framework was removed. Um, and the article was proposing an analytic framework, right? So I think there is uh, there's a, a strain in our field that just rejects sort of speculative or analytic work in favor of uh, the practical. And I, you know, part of that is I love about libraries where material, every we are where rubber hits the road. So you know, fields like anthropology or political science or philosophy or gender studies can think about sort of questions that I've raised, sort of, they can just think about them. But mm -hmm. we work at the library, we gotta make some decisions, you know, we have, to, we have material uh, constraints on what we do. So, you know, that's part of what I find really interesting about it, but also one of the barriers to getting an audience for that kind of work, I think. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, uh, I don't know if you are looking at the chat, um, Emily. Oh, so I can't see the chat and I don't know why. Um, there should be, you should have some kind of control panel um, with a... Uh, be some control. <laughs> um, <laughs> with the, there, there are a couple drop down bars um, underneath like things like audio, oh, webcam. There we app. go. There Fabulous. we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Beth had a little bit of a question. And I mean, um, what you're doing currently was mentioned uh, a little bit in passing, but um, if you could expand on that, sounds like a great idea. Oh, like what I'm doing, like for my job. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, so I just got hired as the new critical pedagogy librarian at the CUNY Graduate Center. So after 11 years as an instruction coordinator at LIU Brooklyn, uh, I am now at the Graduate Center uh, working on critical pedagogy in the context of graduate education. Um, so to your to your question, Joe, about do I um, you know what's hard about doing this work? It just got a whole lot easier, right? Like this institution has made a position that's express that's expressly political, that is about uh, critical perspectives on uh, library work and uh, knowledge organization, and it's I'm just thrilled. This is day three though, and I can't figure out how to get on the Wi-Fi. So you know, it's like that, that's a little bit what's happening. It's like some technical issues on my end, but um, you know, I think 10 years ago that it would have been impossible to even conceive of a job title like that. And to, to have it now tells me how open the field has become to sort of alternative viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and we, I'd like to, anybody else who has questions, um, like I said, drop it in the chat or um, over voice. I can now see the chat, yeah. <laughs> People may say, how is your boyfriend? But with your short hair, they may not ask. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think at this point I'm extremely out. Yeah, talk about being out in, in the workplace as a librarian. You know, I can't, it's like, because of my work, right? So I, I both have written about gender and sexuality and uh, I also edit this book series on that topic um, that has a bunch of books that have come out and, and many of them are about uh, being queer, um, you know, so it's not something that I can avoid being uh, out in the workplace. And, you know, one of the first books on the series was about that, uh, it's called Out Behind the Desk, uh, about sort of uh, being out. I have not had issues with that simply because, uh, I don't know, why have I not had issues about that? I've been very lucky. <laughs> um, Beth, I don't know if you want to, you know, if there's a, a, a particular question about being out, you know, again, it's like contingent and contextual. I get to be out. It's very, I'm very lucky to be in New York, to be unaffected by that, I think. Maybe not unaffected. I don't know. It's an interesting question, though. I just never think about it. I've been out for so long and so public about it. Mm -hmm. We're on voice chat. We are? Yeah. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Um, hi, I'm 
I'm Skylar. I'm one of the, I'm a first year, first semester um, archive student over here at Sliss West. Um, she, her, they, that, um, not by new trans woman. Um, how, how do you think archives are going to have to deal with the increasing uh, fluidity of, well, not increasing fluidity, but the rapid expansion in the language surrounding, say, gender and sexuality, whereas 10, 20 years ago, a lot of these words that are coming into common, more common parlance, how are they going to deal with that? Yeah, that's a big question. And, you know, the, I feel like the language of gender and sexuality has a half-life of like five years, right? Like that, yeah. how I identified, uh, you know, I one of my first library jobs was at uh, Sarah Lawrence College, which had just a really rich and um, changing sort of culture around uh, gender and sexuality and, the, and people identified in, in using language that I had never heard before. And I thought I was like pretty on top of it, you know, and I think um, one of the things that, you know, we don't, you can't fix the language, right? So that's been a central claim in my work is that the effort to fix it, to change it, to go back and uh, correct language that that used to be used but isn't used anymore. Like it's important, but it's also impossible, right? There's just no way to uh, to keep up, right? To go backwards and and you know um, to recuperate identities that were missed because the language hadn't been public and then you know, going forward. So I'm not, I'm not really sure, except for, you know, keeping, um, you know, thinking about access as translation, right? That we have to teach ourselves and teach our patrons about, you know, thinking creatively about the language that may or may not be used. I don't know, Skylar, if you have uh, ideas about how that can be handled. I really um, don't see it as a, I don't see it as a problem with a technical solution simply because things move too quickly. Um, well, from my experience as someone who has came, come out a few times, first as a gay man, then as a trans woman, um, I definitely feel one of the bigger things is just education on mm -hmm. the fact that these words can and do change quickly and that it is hard to keep up at times. but. One of the things I found is that if you get someone, if you at least get someone the basics of it, um, it becomes a lot easier to start adapting. And I think that's something uh, that a lot of fields are going to have to start doing because it's going to start <laughs> coming faster and faster, and uh, the curve is just going to get harder and harder to follow. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like language is political, all of it, and uh, it's uh, contested, all of it, right? So there, you know, and I think that's really true around gender and sexuality. The language is contested, and so teaching people to that that language changes, that it is different depending on time and place and where you are, and that that it's really a translation effort. That's you know, I see it as a as a an information literacy problem more than anything else. Rather than something we could fix, it just seems impossible to fix in place because it changes. You know? Yeah, really interesting things to think about for, um, uh, yes, we have a question, great. Um, in library subject headings, uh, from Laura, in library subject headings, the terms relating to people's sexual orientation and or gender identity is often off. Um, I have seen a transgender subject heading when the character is bisexual. I'm hoping at the very least that we can get better at this. Yeah, good point, Laura. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, I, I think you know, the, there's stuff that some people know and other people don't, you know, and it's something that we take for granted when the issue is physics or um, maybe American history. But when it comes to gender and sexuality, people imagine that everybody knows everything about it, you know, and they don't. Like it's not, it, you know, I, I, I think 
many straight people would have, you know, are completely befuddled, they just don't understand. And, you know, there are things that people understand either because of their experience and identity or because of the uh, research work that they have done. You know, so Laura, what you're describing sounds like a problem of having someone who doesn't know anything about the field being asked to catalog those works. And you wouldn't put me, um, you know, you wouldn't put me in charge of cataloging physics. I got a D in physics. It's not appropriate, you know, and I think uh, recognizing that there's expertise that some people have and other people don't around gender and sexuality is really critical. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at your chat, Laura. Um, Depth siblings. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so uh, Laura said at the Eric Carle Museum in Amherst, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, they had a beautiful LGBTQ display showing all of the LGBTQ um, picture books of recent. There was a picture book about two adopted daughters with same sex mothers. The whole entire book was about how these two girls were actual sisters and real family, and the subject heading was step siblings. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do think, like, like uh, you know, and, and thinking about Skylar's question about archives, like the, um, you know, queerness really messes up ideas of. Uh, uh, what do you call that when you, um, sorry, what's the word for when uh, you're tracing the lineage of something? Genealogy. Uh, yeah, so genealogy gets really uh, confused and confusing around uh, gender and sexuality. I have a kid um, that my partner had and then I met her and now I'm a parent, but the language around mom and parenting is just inappropriate to our situation but mm -hmm. yeah we're a real family I don't know how we'd be cataloged you know, <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> like kids um, at school are always like are you are you Oscar's babysitter like kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, Laura said, um, I highly recommend the display um, at the Eric Carl Museum. Go visit the oh, museum cool. in the library there. You know, my, Thank you, Laura. Our, my brother and his family are in, uh, in, in Amherst. They teach at Amherst, so I should, I should go up and, and take a look at it. That is really great. Yeah. Um, Laura says, I can't believe it was in the children's room for all to see. It was amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, um, I'm, uh, so I recently visited the um, Lesbian History Archives in New, in New York, in Brooklyn. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I, they have taken a very literal approach to changing issues of patriarchy or history in their cataloging and all, everything is organized by first name um, instead of last name. Um, uh, have you seen other like because we're we're talking about um, subject headings and and I think more in the settings of like common already hegemonic settings of libraries uh, that have already been set up that have a long history. Um, but have you encountered examples of um, actively queer settings of uh, libraries and? Um, ways in which people from the ground up try to do it a different way. Yeah, I um, worked uh, briefly on the establishment of the library at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, which is a, 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 a legal services um, group that works for uh, on behalf of transgender and gender nonconforming people of color, primarily uh, living in poverty. And so this is a group of people who if you use Library of Congress subject headings to classify the work, it's all transgender, or transgenderism, I think is one of the headings, and it's like not useful, right? And the, um, we had, it was a small committee and we, you know, it was a real struggle to figure out what the ordering scheme was gonna be, right? Because we did want order, right? So that's one of the things that I really find interesting is like, it's not like you could go without it, right? We have to make some decisions about how we're gonna order the books. Otherwise, it's just a big random pile and nobody can access it, right? So retrieval requires us to um, come up with a classification scheme. And that was really tough, right? Because uh, language around identity is really personal and it's really meaningful and really challenging to try to come up with um, something that would work for 
uh, everybody. Uh, and so we didn't um, we didn't classify things. Uh, we, we classified them using big sort of broad categories of things. So, so that you know, uh, sort of style, right? Um, music. Uh, sort of a little bit more like you would do a bookstore, but using language that emerged from the small group of people who were pulling it together. Um, I think another example is the Prelinger Library, uh, not a queer library, but uh, another collection that has made sort of overt decisions about classification that tell a particular story, like they, you know, time and landscape and sort of big categories like that. Uh, so definitely still ordered, but ordered to tell a different kind of story than the one that are the, the sort of standard, um, sort of standard library classification scheme tells. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things you get from a queer collection is like you're intentional about it, in a way that I think people with, uh, you know, working from inside a dominant ideology who imagine that they don't have one, right? Because you talk to, like a lot of people think cataloging is simply objective. I read the book and I described it. What's the issue? You know, um, if you're coming out of that dominant ideology, you're, you don't have to think about the choices that you make. So I would say that's what sets apart a, a queer collection. It's like the people have to, you know, they're thinking intentionally about the ideological story they're telling because everybody's going to tell one. So you're just thinking about the one that you're going to tell and, and you're explicit enough about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, Laura mentioned that the name of the picture book uh, is Real Sisters Pretend. Mm. Did we have uh, other That's questions? Really cool. <clears throat> yep. Is there someone at Sliss West who has a question? I'm not sure. <laughs> so, Emily? This is M. Claire hi. Knowles. And, oh, hi, hi, I'm cool. <laughs> and I'm bringing you greetings from uh, Simmons, and also from um, I don't know if you know the name of Brian Norman. He may have maybe he knows. Oh, yeah. Just... yeah. Yeah. He was. Uh, yeah, he was in, in Baltimore with my sister. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So uh, he uh, when I told him that I. Um, that I knew you and he was all excited about you. So thank you so much for mm -hmm. being here. I, I just saw him at another program um, um, in his college. He's in another college, but I'm really glad to have you speak with our students. And I just for the folks uh, around, Emily and I were on a panel a couple of years ago. So it is, and also we sit on council of the American Library Association. Mm -hmm. Great. So well, again, yeah, we're part of the governing body. Yep. Yeah. What was the panel you were on? Oh, I should also say that, you know, uh, today around, um, we're on, there was a book discussion at the American Library Association around white fragility. And so um, I thought we've had the discussion about whites um, dealing with their own anti-racism. That's a discussion that's going on in our school. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. there's a student group and around this table is Lean Nguyen, who is our diversity fellow, and she's facilitating that discussion today. Lots of stuff going around social politics, and, and Simmons is definitely a place where um, it, I like to think it's, a, it's an open community for queer people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those uh, anti-racism discussions are so critical to have. That's great that you're, that you're yeah, it was such an interesting, um, it was such a great uh, talk at ALA Midwinter, uh, hearing from Robin D'Angelo and yeah, lots of productive discussions to have. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and Claire, was there this kind of openness? You know, it's, this kind of openness feels new to me. I don't know if it feels new to you. It feels like, a, like there's, there's more room for these conversations than there was maybe 10 years ago. About everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything. everything. About everything. 
And even about language, as you say, is that we you can go back and correct it, but it's like it's changing as every day as we move forward. Mm -hmm. And I think it's cross language, you know, people, you know, just for a scholar identifying saying I'm a trans woman. I, I think it's I, I hope she's really comfortable being able to say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we do have uh, you know, student leaders meetings where people identify what their pronouns are. And it has been, and we have, you know, an opportunity for people when they're even applying for jobs. I know when I hire students, that's one of two questions that I always ask, you know, what are your personal pronouns? Just so that mm -hmm. makes them feel comfortable. So yeah, we're, we're, we're a social justice institution though. And I think if you put that in your mission statement, as Simmons University has done, then it is, it's going to be sometimes difficult discussions being made. Mm -hmm. And that's open, you know, you're open for difficult discussions to occur. <coughs> um, yeah, I so, think it's, this stuff is so important to put inside of those uh, documents that you may not imagine apply to you, right? If you're used to sort of being on the outside of organizations or institutions, because then you have a, a document to struggle over. You can say, look, this is the mission statement, the strategic plan, the whatever says that we're committed to this. I don't feel that commitment. What work are we doing for that commitment? You know, we, we need to be accountable to that. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to sort of have the conversation on the outside, but to get it inside the mainstream document, you know, and I think some of us have anxieties that things will be co-opted, but I think, you know, it just gives you terrain to fight. I always think about terrain of struggle. Like, do I, how do I get that? set up mm -hmm. for myself you know is it through is it through the strategic plan is it through uh the the collectively bargained union contract is it through you know spectra's mission statement or simmons mission statement you know getting the language in there so that you can begin to, to struggle over it because it's a constant struggle you know forever struggle um, and radical that's what really gets me up every morning like, yeah yeah um uh, Raya in the chat uh, mentioned uh, the White Fragility event this afternoon um, from 4 to 6 Eastern Standard Time is being streamed. Um, thank you, Raya. Um, and the link to uh, that is in the GoToMeeting for, um, is in the chat for uh, anyone on chat um, attending remotely who is interested in that as well. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Laura, for the shout out to Spectra. Um, very cool to hear from you. Um, uh, Laura started Spectra six years ago, so thank you. Oh, cool. Thank you, Laura. Um, and and thank happy you birthday. birthday. <laughs> yeah. Um, Laura's birthday? Yes. Oh, oh happy <laughs> birthday, Laura. <laughs> thank you for starting Spectra. We are. We, we appreciate, appreciate it. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, does anyone have any further questions? Oh yeah, uh, Laura says, um, is that White Fragility go-to meeting done by ALA? Um, no, it's uh, Simmons. Um, uh, this is a, the Simmons specific event. Um, and um, do we know if it will be archived? Uh, it will probably be recorded, no? It won't be recorded, oh, okay. but um, I think these conversations will continue to happen. And I know Robin D'Angelo spoke at ALA. She speaks yes. around a lot, so. Yeah, there should be other opportunities. Yeah, to, to yeah, it's a that. it's a, an event organized by Simmons uh, Progressive Librarians Guild. Um, and if you would like to get in touch with them, they've got an email um, and can keep you in the loop about what we're doing over here. Yeah. Um, what's their email? Let me find. It. PLG at Simmons .edu. Yeah. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really, then easy to remember. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> email uh, address yeah it's interesting you know those conversations really need to happen locally i think you know that we we make worlds where we are and so it's it's great to sort of see those kinds of conversations happening within communities i know that uh council ala council i think is a you know a group that will be doing some work around um anti-racism uh, together you know since we have to be in community with one another yeah mm -hmm. well Emily what happened is that um, because of all the discussion around um, 
what happened at LA Council, uh, mm -hmm. the director uh, reported it back to the faculty. And then um, I just kind of pitched in and said, look, I'll buy you books if you all have discussion. And so our diversity fellow who's sitting at Lee, who will lead that discussion, said, yeah, I want to do it for students, too. Mm -hmm. And so, Great. you know, bought, bought 50 copies of the book. So. I'm Claire, you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, but one sure it happens, you know, because, yeah, there are people who we need to have the discussion. And that's the kind of discussion that's here mm -hmm. about being open and having difficult discussions at Simmons that we're about for justice. Um, Laura mentioned uh, that Laura is now a uh, librarian at the Swamska Library um, and holds a monthly discussion every month called Let's TED Talk the Issues. Ooh, oh, that's cool. They, TED talk, uh, they watch a TED Talk and then hold the a community discussion on tough topics like poverty, body, body image, white privilege, um, animal welfare, how to be an LGBTQ ally, etc. Um, because these talks need to be out there and the library can be a safe space for those talks. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. fabulous. Great, Laura. This yeah. is good to know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a question for Emily. I was, I don't know if I came in a little bit late. So <laughs> we really appreciate you talking with us. So thank you so much for being here. And I just, I was, curious if we could hear more about I know you've written I think we've heard more about querying the catalog which is amazing and I do want to hear more about that too but also about your paper on reference services to incarcerated people mm -hmm. if you had just anything to share about that or about the process that led to it sure, sure. so yeah. I uh, I teach a reference class at the Pratt Institute Library School uh, and we have a partnership with the New York Public Library uh, Division of Correctional Librarianship. Um, and I don't know about your reference class at Simmons. My reference class at Syracuse, like I got 100 questions and I had to go and answer them. Uh, hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. That's, just, that's an old why. way. <laughs> why? Why? So, but you do, you know. You do have to learn how to answer questions, how to do reference and work and respond to people's queries, and that's part of the job. And so this is a, a way that students learn to do reference work by responding to queries from uh, people who are incarcerated. So uh, each week we'll get a set of letters and we'll and I hand them out to students and they respond to the letters. And it, you know, the students I think learn a lot, right? Like the reference interview, if you can't do one as a patron, it is really tough, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're dealing with just the mail, um, how can you respond uh, adequately, you know, and it's a, it's a real challenge, but um, I think a really important service and, you know, you, you learn immediately, you know, like how, how many times have you Googled something today? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I don't know, a hundred times, right? I just like, I'm always like, I have an idle question and then I Google it. If you are incarcerated, you don't have access to the internet, yeah. you know? And so we get questions that are like, can you go and like look at my Facebook, right? Or questions, uh, what I find interesting are the questions that are produced by incarceration. How do I, are there any home remedies for um, black mold, you know? I'm incarcerated in a place with black mold and, and the state won't take care of that problem and I think I'm getting sick. What are some things I can do? Uh, how can I start a business? Many of the questions are about how can I start a business? I think because uh, your employment options are so limited once you're incarcerated. And so it's a it's a great project because it teaches us about reference, but you we also learn a lot about um, the problems of mass incarceration and mm -hmm. the sort of how yeah. wide ranging the effects are and how information needs are really produced by by that system um, that just shouldn't shouldn't be right like no one should be asking me a question about how to handle on my own uh, illness caused by black mold like people shouldn't be in, in cages and they shouldn't be in cages that are infected with black mold and you know I think it uh, for me has really clarified some uh, abolitionist principles that I came in in with and now uh, truly believe in, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Is that a um, service that is possible to volunteer for? Um, do, yes. Is that specific to New York? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if they actually have remote volunteers, and I think more and more libraries are doing letter services. I know there's a letter service now at San Francisco Public Library and at Brooklyn Public Library, but I'm happy if you want to email me after this, I, I'm happy to connect you with the folks at, at NYPL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, definitely, thank you. It's so much more meaningful when you have an authentic question, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a, that, I mean, that's a really interesting example of how librarians and reference, I mean, we've, we spend so much time in many of our classes admitting that um, people won't ask us the same questions that many people were trained to answer years and years ago, uh, mm -hmm. at least in libraries. Mm -hmm. um, so to hear the ways in which that is both still relevant and still incredibly necessary in a way where we don't have to justify, you know, there's a lot of information and librarians can manage it better, but that that like tends to, people aren't super convinced by that one and it doesn't change our society to be able to say it, but mm -hmm. places yeah. which is really necessary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That seems important. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Things I can share. <laughs> Emily, can you talk about some of the symposiums that you've also done? Yeah, so sure. Yeah, I missed the last one, which was at Simmons and sponsored by Spectra, and we're eternally grateful for that. Um, uh, so I edit this book series about gender and sexuality and information studies, and it has, I think, 10 books on this series at this point, and I think has really opened up uh, a sort of area of the field that people uh, can write in and around. Um, in, I guess we've had three, three of the uh, symposia, uh, 2018, 2016, and 2014. So they're happening every other year. The first one was at the University of Toronto after a book called, um, which of course I can't remember the name of, uh, it's a it's a collection of feminist and queer information studies texts, and I, I really love it because it includes both uh, information studies scholars alongside um, alongside uh, other work on gender and sexuality. Right, so mm -hmm. librarians write about the um, classification of gender in the library, but Dean Spade, for example, writes about classifications of gender and sexuality at the border, right, in terms of immigration or in terms of incarceration, um, sort of putting those texts together so that they can speak to one another. It's a great book. You should all run out and buy it. Um, anyway, so the, the book sort of prompted this symposium where we gathered people together who had written uh, for that first book to talk about gender and sexuality issues at the University of Toronto. Um, and I don't know how many of you have organized things. It's like thankless work. It's exhausting. It's like, <laughs> how much coffee should we order? Like, are, is the tech going to work? You know, I hate it. I don't know if you guys hate it, but I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> But then you go to the day and it's like, we can have conversations that, that blow your mind and people are doing work that's just like absolutely amazing. And then like connections come out of those those meetings that just, uh, flourish and you see new work develop and conversations that ought to be happening begin happening, they begin happening um, at the symposium and then things get published out of the symposium. So I was like convinced to do it a second time at the University of, uh, or at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Again, oh my God, how are we gonna arrange the tables? I don't care, but we have to decide and I hate it, it's horrible. And what do we have on the name tag? Like name tag politics? Oh, it's so exhausting. We have to make collective decisions. Collective decisions are the worst. But then we got there and we had hired this woman to come and uh, sing at the opening of the event. And uh, she led us all in song in a song that she had written about the abstracts from the symposium. And it was like, oh, wow. unbelievable to be in fellowship with people who share your perspectives. And, you know, that's kind of rare actually in the library world. Like, that doesn't happen to me all that often. So, 
then somebody at Simmons was like, let's do it at Simmons, Allie Goffman. And I was like, oh, can we do a box lunch or a buffet? Oh, kill me now. <laughs> yeah. People loved it. I wasn't able to make it, but people were really transformed. So we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again at, the, at George Washington University in 2020. Uh, the theme is going to be gender and technology. And we're assembling the sort of committee to pull that together right now. And uh, we'll start making decisions about coffee and stuff. But it'll be July 2020. <laughs> so put it on your calendar in your head. Again, I was like, oh, I'm done. But it pulled me back in. <laughs> fellowship thing. You get people together. Talk about ideas. It's just like nothing yeah. better, right? Yeah. Nothing better. Yeah. I, I find it interesting that you describe that as rare. Uh, well, not interesting, um, but... Uh, that you yeah. describe that as rare in the in the library in the library profession, or I think just in profession in general, um, mm -hmm. might be true as well, um, because you have to yeah. do things all the time. Um, <laughs> have you had nobody shares my politics, right? Like I don't know, mm -hmm. four people. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice when we can get together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you find that there's a community. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you you know if you don't know the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, you should look it up. It's a it's a group that is trying to make in the world the world that they want. You know, so I think we often think about like the future, but then you know the way we organize things is very much in you know reproduces sort of hierarchies and systems of oppression, and you know uh, the person who's been there longest gets to make all the decisions. The person with the most money gets to decide. You know, and that's an organization that has really um, is a model I think for how to be in the in the world as you wish it to be even as the world is what it what it is now mm -hmm. yeah. i'm interested in hearing more about um your experiences navigating that uh political difference um and especially in terms of how your work and your writing is received by librarians um how how have you navigated it so far when things, when, when people aren't willing to listen or they get angry about a certain topic, um, especially when it comes to like actually securing a position um, and, and keeping it <laughs> for, for a livelihood. <laughs> right. Right. Cause like I went into librarianship cause I was working in magazines. Right. And I was like, Oh, if I ever want to leave New York, what am I going to do? And mm -hmm. I was like, there's no job, but there's a library everywhere. You know? <laughs> Yeah. I didn't want to be a nurse because like bodies are scary, but being a librarian <laughs> seemed like something I could do. Uh, I've been uh, lucky to have primarily union positions since I started in, in library work. I think uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's power in a union, there's power in a collective uh, that if you step out on your own, that is really risky and scary and dangerous. But if you have um, mm -hmm. solidarity from, from colleagues, that's I think most important. So uh, I've done some things in my career that were about establishing my career so that I can keep my job, right? So my, I had tenure at LIU Brooklyn. In order to get it, I had to do, my dean told me I had to write something about my daily work. So I wrote an article about with a colleague about analyzing syllabi for information literacy outcomes, you know? And it's like, I don't know, this is a useful article. It's been cited a lot by other people who are interested in that work. I don't, um, uh, care about it you know <laughs> like, yeah. I've done some things I don't care about in order to keep my job but uh, having having union protection has been really critical you know and I also recognize my my enormous privilege of uh, being someone who gets jobs right I'm although I have to say it took me three years to get a job out of LIU so I've been looking for three years until I landed this, this gig at CUNY so it's not like it's easy for me to get a job but I think my um which I actually think is due to some of my writing, right? People don't want to hire uh, necessarily a rabble rouser, which is less about my, I think my academic scholarship and more about my union activism uh, in the last few years. But I think having a, having a collective has been really critical, having legal protections under a collective we bargained contract, and then having tenure, which I had at LIU and was able to transfer here to CUNY. So, you know, they can fire me, but it would be really hard. And I think that liberates me to say a lot of things. And I take that, you know, really seriously. Although if you look at my record, I was saying those things all along. And I don't think that tenure and sort of structural protections, um, like I, I kind of think we are who we are. We, you know, my, as my dad used to say, we get better at what we do a lot. 
which is also what my kid's uh, baseball coach says. You know, we get better at the things we practice. And so we have to be disciplined and practiced in resistance, disciplined and practiced in organizing, and disciplined and practiced in protecting each other. Um, you know, and so that's, you know, it takes, it takes work to develop those skills. Um, and, you know, life has thrown me a bunch of opportunities to develop them, which is like, a, you know, kind of a shame, but I guess I'm in some ways lucky. I was thinking about that this morning, actually. I was like, huh, getting locked out really sucked, but I learned a lot about how to organize uh, against power. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful for that, you know. I bet I need those skills again, or maybe later today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, how, how is that experience specifically have you had any like thoughts about how libraries do labor since that or um that have changed yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i have yeah <laughs> the first time in my life where i earned real enemies you know like i am sure that i have people who don't like my work whatever they don't like me but this was union stuff this stuff you will find um you know i had a at a public campaign mounted against me. Somebody, you know, emailed all my colleagues and everyone I've ever worked with to tell them what a terrible person I was, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's like, wow, this really sucks. But um, I think what I learned from that is the, is the power of collective action, concerted collective action, you know, that like I can make small changes to my classification scheme over here in my library. And that's important. It's not unimportant. It's important, but organized action, right? That is, you know, that's the only way you make changes on a on a big scale, right? On a on a that you make structural change, right? Mm -hmm. So like, and I think librarians are good at that, right? Like we develop systems, mm -hmm. yes, and then we flood those systems with uh, things with power, right? Um, uh, we do that every time we catalog something. We do that every time we put something on the calendar, right? Like, what are the priorities that I put on my calendar? You know, that's like organizing work, and so thinking about that as uh, stuff we can do on behalf of each other, um, I think is really critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bye, Laura. It was really great that you were here. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Laura Bye, says, Laura. thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, does anyone have any um, further questions? We have four minutes left before I end this recording. Um, and then you're welcome to, um, uh, introduce yourself as well in, in a for 10 ish minutes um, if Emily can stay for that um, afterwards. But yeah, we've got four minutes left of the official event. Um, so speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> um, I would love to hear your thoughts on the, as an ALA counselor, on the ALA midwinter and how you think things will be moving forward if you think the meaningful if there is really meaningful action being taken. I know you mentioned that they are really trying to do some work on racism, but um, I don't know if you have any other thoughts about this. Yeah, the specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to make <laughs> sure that we're not like no no no. It's just yeah. but specifically the the event where um, someone got really racist at a, a ALA professional attendee and um, nothing was said in the moment uh, about it yeah. um, to chastise him for that. So um, that's specifically the event that we're talking about. I, it gets talked about a lot, so I don't blame you yeah. for not. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I I you know I wasn't I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> So I, I sort of only know what was reported, but it was interesting to me that after April, you know, after April Hathcock shared her experience on Twitter, many, many, many other people stepped forward to talk about the sort of racist incidents they had experienced. And so um, I think it's, it is painful and important to have those sorts of uh, experiences surfaced and critical to center them as an organization. Uh, I am not privy to the higher level workings. So I know that the association has been putting, putting a committee together to talk about anti-racist uh, actions that the association can take. Um, I've been, you know, maybe you can tell that I've been thoroughly transformed by my union experience. And so I really believe that uh, what's necessary is a, a wholesale change in how we uh, talk to each other, 
you know, uh, and the kind of listening that we do with each other. There's a council is, is very formal and sort of impenetrable, yeah. I think, you know, it's like hard to figure out how to talk there. Um, mm -hmm. But as long as we're going to be a group that meets regularly to deliberate together, we have to have conversations that um, about uh, sort of how, how race structures the experience. You know, like a lot of people were like, this isn't, this isn't uh, about race. I'm like, well, maybe it's not to you, but it, it is you know, to a, a lot of people. And, I, you know, it's that, that problem, again, of coming from the dominant ideology and not understanding that you have one because it's the norm. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I'd, it's hard to make big organizations move and change. There's a lot that needs to be addressed. Um, and Claire probably knows more about uh, sort of actions they're taking at the at the higher echelons. But I'm looking forward to annual to see. You know, my concern is that it will be another uh, case where people sit and get a report read to them, and I think that is a really uh, ineffective way of handling situations. Like I want to feel like the association empowers me to act. Uh, part of the way that also like organizations do that is they listen, you know. We talk in the union about the 80-20 rule. I'm gonna listen 80% of the time and talk 20% of the time. Wow, you go to these meetings and it's just like 100% getting talked at. You're like, I don't know how, how change happens uh, when I don't yeah. hear all of us speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Emily, since we are talking, I am on a committee appointed by the president about changing uh, the, whether or not we have those meetings that that incident did happen. Because that's not really an official meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and much of that discussion, we should go at, on at conference, but we, I mean, at, at council. And I think, and I think we need to prepare people to have those discussions about the the work, not yeah. not but in in the conduct as many different um, divisions, roundtables have all been coming out with the um, the code of appropriate conduct. That's been interesting to me. Mm. Their statements, you know, we usually talk about a code of conduct, and all of a sudden now it's the code of appropriate conduct. Mm -hmm. But I think it and is it is a bigger issue because when I start looking at ALA think tank, um, I don't look at it <laughs> <laughs> because I think a lot of individuals don't want to even be at council because they look at ALA and who ALA a lot who pays money. You said who has power, who pays money to come to the exhibits and how those exhibitors treat individuals. And that was my concern about not just what happened to Ms. Hathcock, you know, yeah. and I think that whatever, ha I don't know what happened except what I read on email yeah. and, you know, and I know I went up to Ms. Hathcock that following morning and said, you said you felt like you needed a hug. I said, I'm coming to you because I'm going to give you a hug. I may not like what happened, but I'm giving you a hug because you said you felt like you. And I said, I don't want you to leave council yeah. mm -hmm. because your voice is needed. Mm -hmm. All of your voices are needed. You know, but I think that the exhibitors, I think they need some, uh, they need some training. Yeah. You know, I think there's everybody and it's like you said about, about the collective and it's the individual fingers that come together that that can result in a ball of power, I think it's got to come from a lot of different areas. A lot of different people have to speak up. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah. So, a lot we of, don't yeah. know until what's going to happen. I mean, thank goodness ALA is changing its footprint and the direction. Maybe council will be smaller. Um, there's a lot of change that's going to happen, which is exciting. Let's face it, you know. Yeah. Which yeah. Is, change is change is exciting and a little scary. But we're lots of making. Yeah, yeah, but again, those codes of conduct, right, and those codes of appropriate conduct, they are like you write it down, it doesn't produce reality, it's, right? Like I reality agree. is produced yeah. by through and over those documents. But you have to have them as a first step, I think. It's sort of like what you said, you know, um, at council the following one, you say, 
all these people are coming up to the mic apologizing that they didn't speak up. And I mean, there were like 10. I mean, I felt like there were like 20, you know, and then you said, but, but what does that change anything? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. People seek absolution, you know, mm-hmm. yes. you understand that, but it's not about your feelings. You know, that's why I have like friends and, and lovers and therapists, <laughs> you know, it's not, <laughs> yeah. you know, I don't, yeah. I don't need the people harmed by my actions to forgive me for them. You know, yeah. that's, that's an inappropriate ask, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we could talk about this all day. And really, yeah, it's really. true. Thank you I'm again. Glad to have that that uh, white fragility live stream later. That's, that's yes, great. it's a it's a very full um, and productive day. I, oh, I yeah. hope. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for being on. Um, I'm going yeah. to end the recording here. Um, and anyone who uh, wishes to can introduce himself. Um, off mic, but um, thanks again, and uh, let's keep up this partnership. I, 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 I hope we can.